Hey, well, good morning, RCC. Whether you are in the room or you're joining with us online this morning, we are so grateful you're here with us. What an amazing day to be in the house of the Lord celebrating Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm going to invite us to stand. We're going to sing and declare that in song this morning. Go ahead and worship with us. Glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. So open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river of glory.
today church he is worthy of our praise he's worthy of it amen hey go ahead and have a seat and pay attention to the screen so you can see what's happening here at rcc hey everyone i'm maureen Natz. i'm the children's director here at rcc and i have a couple announcements for you first our easter egg hunt is this sunday march 28th it's from three to five and it's going to be a great time you don't want to miss it we're going to have 10,000 eggs to hunt for we're going to have a photo booth the easter bunny is going to be there we're going to have food trucks so be sure to join us from three to five it's going to be a fun free uh, family event so we'll see you there second as we celebrate our risen savior on easter sunday april 4th we have three services for you to choose from we have our sunrise service at 6 30 which is going to be outside by the cross and then we also have our normal nine o'clock and 10 30 service so we look forward to seeing you there and finally we have our outreach and missions night coming up on april 7th at 6 30. so plan on attending and hearing about some of the outreach opportunities and how rcc is making a difference both globally and locally we are so glad you're here with us at rcc today i hope that you 
you grabbed a bulletin on your way in in the breezeway to follow along the sermon and know what's going on in RCC. Also, if you're watching online, you can just go below and fill out the video notes right there. The communion cups can also be found in the breezeways on your way in. And if you have anything that we can be praying about, just grab the card in front of you, write your prayer requests down, and you can either put them at the crosses or in the giving box on your way out. Lastly, there are several ways you can give, and we appreciate your generosity. You can either text, mail into the church, go to riverchristian.church slash give, or just put it in the giving boxes as you leave. We thank you so much for being here today. Let us just prepare our hearts as we hear the message and experience the power and presence of Jesus Christ. Good morning, RCC. It is so very good to see you. Thank you so very much for making the decision to be with us today. Uh, we first want to thank you for your incredible graciousness and generosity. Uh, this is a giving church. Um, it is a generous church, and even those are huge understatements. And we want you to know uh, that your generosity and your graciousness are not only making huge impacts here at RCC, uh, but in our surrounding community and the entire world. And so we just want to say thank you so very much. We also want to encourage you, encourage you and challenge you to keep up the fantastic work. Selfless, humble, and sacrificial are only three of the many words that capture the father that my dad has been, that the father that my dad has been to me. As a single parent, he taught me how to read when I came home crying in second grade, not knowing how to read. What I didn't know at that time was that he had only gone through seventh grade himself and really didn't know how to read and write that well. My dad was the one who introduced me to Jesus Christ and his love. My dad empowered me to chase and capture opportunities that he never had. But as much as my dad loved me, and as much as my dad still loves me, the fact of the matter and the reality of the situation is that my dad's love does not come close to comparing to the selfless, humble, and sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus's selflessness, humility, and sacrificial love are all on full display as he enters Jerusalem one final time for what will be the last week of his earthly life. As a Christian community, we recognize today and celebrate today as Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week. Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem was celebrated by throngs of people in Matthew 21. Listen to what the people shouted what the people shouted about Jesus in verse 9. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Make no mistake about it, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem was celebratory in nature. But I can't help but think that as Jesus was being celebrated, there were no celebrations taking place within him. As people lauded, applauded, and praised Jesus, he knew that in a span of a few short days, many of those same people would be opening their mouths and fixing their lips to utter the devastatingly brutal words, crucify him. As many of those people on Palm Sunday conceptualized Jesus as a physical king, he never lost sight of who he really was. He never lost sight of what his mission truly was. And as we sit here this morning, about to enter into a time of communion, I believe that Jesus had each one of us in mind. I believe that Jesus had all of humanity in mind as he entered Jerusalem in total humility. I believe that his heart was breaking knowing the savage and dehumanizing death that lay ahead of him. But I also believe that he was resolute, as Luke chapter 9, verse 51 states. Resolute in his pursuit of Jerusalem. Resolute in his pursuit of the cross. And it was because of that pursuit and because of his execution that we all 
get to sit here as forgiven individuals. So this morning, as we eat the bread that represents Jesus's body and drink the cup that represents his blood as a community of faith, may we know in the deepest parts of who we are that we will never be loved by anything or anyone else more fully and more completely than Jesus Christ. May our hearts and souls resoundingly declare that Jesus' selflessness, his humility, and his sacrificial love call us to be selfless, humble, and sacrificial in the ways that we love each other and the ways that we love the community around us. Please pray with me. Father, we do thank you so very much for your invitation your invitation to be selfless, to be humble, and to be sacrificial in the way that we love the world around us. Father, help us to embrace that type of love from you. Father, we're aware that so many things in this world are calling our names. So many voices, even our own, we hear on a daily basis. But Father, we pray that your voice would take first priority in our lives every day and every moment of every day. Father, thank you that we get to celebrate Palm Sunday, but help us to know that our salvation, our forgiveness came at the highest of cost. And so as a result, Father, help us to live lives that are liberated, help us to live lives that simply yet beautifully declare that you love us, and you love the entire world. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Great, your love was great. Oh. 
great to have you. Hey, welcome all those who join us online today. Will you welcome all those right now all around the country? Love you guys. So glad to have you with us this morning. Hey, please have a seat. Please have a seat. I tell you, it's exciting right now because um, there are some amazing servants among us, even in the room. And uh, one of them I want to draw is a guy named Bill Burns. I wish you could see this photo right here, but he handed this to us right before the service. And this photo right here is POW is being released. Uh, this is their anniversary right here of them being released, and Bill Burns was one of them. Can we just thank God for these guys being released from <laughs> Vietnam? So that is amazing, and I uh, wish you could see that, uh, see the joy that's coming out of those guys and their freedom. Um, so uh, just thank you, Bert, uh, Bill, for all you do, and I'm glad, so glad you're here today. Um, today we're diving in right back into our Bible series, and that is It Is Written, and today we go into 1 Samuel, and 1 Samuel, you would think, okay, it's going to be about Samuel, right? That's what it's going to be about. But actually, it starts off talking about a woman who struggles with conceiving a child, and I know that topic may hit close to home to some of you. Some of you may be struggling with that. Uh, some of you may know someone else who's struggling with that right now, but I want you to know the story is not just about a woman who has difficulty with conceiving a child. This story is about anyone who's ever had to live with any unfulfilled longing in their life. Now, how many of you have ever had to live with any unfulfilled longing in your life? How many of you guys have ever had an unfulfilled longing? Raise your hand. All right? If your hand's not up, that means you're already sleeping. All right? You usually give me five minutes. All right? So uh, it's not a good sign. All of us have had unfulfilled longings in our life. And all of us can understand a little bit here what's going on. So look at what the story starts off with in chapter 1, verse 1 of 1 Samuel. Here's what it says. There was a certain man whose name was Elkanah. He had two wives. One was called Hannah. The other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had what? None. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the, the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of, of his meat to his wife Penina and to her sons and to her daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her to irritate her. And this went on, it says again, year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept. And look what happened. She would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, he would say these words, Hannah, why? Are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? And then he really sticks his foot in his mouth when he says these words right here. Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? If that's not a need for marriage counseling right there, I don't know what is. Right? I mean, her name means grace. That's what Hannah means. It means favor. Another translation means grace. Another meaning just, just because her name means grace doesn't mean she feels much grace right now in her life. Not being able to have a child, especially in ancient times, was terrible because first, it's going against your maternal, a lot of maternal instinct that women have, a lot of them have. But the other is that in ancient times, for you to have any kind of validity, any kind of standing in your culture, you had to have babies, especially boys. And so most likely Hannah was the first wife of Elkanah, but because she could not have children, he married another woman named Penina. And Penina began to give birth right out of the gate, which added on to even more burden to Hannah, because now she has this other woman who's living with her that is getting pregnant, and it made it even worse. And then what made it even worse than that was Penina would provoke her and irritate her. It reminds me of a Seinfeld episode where Jerry and Lane are talking about the difference between men and women and how they fight. And Lane says, you know, when boys fight, they, they get into it, they punch each other, and all of a sudden when it's over, it's over. They just move on. She says, well, women get in a fight. What they do is they, they talk behind each other's backs until one of them develops an eating disorder. <laughs> and that's not too far from what's happening right here because Hannah's not eating and on top of that, she has a husband that means well, but tragically misfires in his attempt to console his wife. And many of us men 
behave this way, right? We, we see someone we love hurting, and so what we do, we swoop in and we want to fix it. But in our desire to fix it, we say some really boneheaded things, and we end up doing more damage than good. He, he thinks his own existence, get this, what if your husband did this to you? He thinks his own existence is blessing enough to outweigh whatever burden. I mean, can I, I can't imagine going to my wife going, I know you're really sad about that, but I'm right here. I mean, you have me. Why would you ever be sad? I don't understand. I mean, what guy would ever think to say that? Well, he goes and he does that. And, and he's like, I, don't I mean more to you than your burden of 10 sons? And he takes her burden and he makes it all about who? Him. You ever done that? I know one guy's done that. I have. I've done it in my marriage. My wife's come with a burden. And she's, she's asked people to pray. And, and, and you know, I, I need help with this. And somehow I've taken that and I've made it about me. I don't know, subconsciously, but I control the narrative and I made it about myself. And that, that, that's something that happens quite a bit with people that we love, right? If we're not careful, we'll take their burden and we make it all about us. Instead of lightening their burden, we end up increasing it. And not only does Hannah have a rival picking on her and a husband who's terrible at consoling her, now she's got problems at church. And this happens at church. This happens when, when she's at Shiloh in a season of worship and every year Elkanah and his wives would go up to trip to Shiloh and there would be a religious feast called the temp, uh, Temple of the Tabernacles, Feast of the Tabernacles, which is basically a feast of celebration. It's party. There's a rejoicing in the Lord because the harvest has come in. I mean, it's just a huge celebration. That's what, that's what it is. And here everyone else is celebrating and there's Hannah and she's in the midst of her own famine. Elkanah knows the burden that's on Hannah and that she's carrying her heart. And so what he does, he gives her a double portion. Remember, he gives her a double portion of meat. But guess who sees that? Penina. And that just fires her up. And so Penina can't stand it. And so Penina begins provoking to irritate Hannah. And Hannah would start to weep. And her husband would kick in his counseling gifts. And then she'd weep more. And this went on how long? Year after year after year after year after year. Maybe you feel like you're in that. She's learned to anticipate it. She dreads this trip to Shiloh. Have you ever dreaded going to a place of worship because you knew people would be there celebrating? You knew people would be lifting up their hands and, you know, just feeling free in the Lord as they're praising the Lord. But you, you had this burden and you're asking yourself right now, does God even see me? There are times we wonder, is God really amongst us? Because we've been crying out for relief and I'm still carrying the burden. I've been crying out and crying out and crying out to God. I've been going to Shiloh year after year after year. Does he even know I exist? Does he even hear my voice anymore? And Hannah's saying, in the midst of everyone celebrating together, I'm the barren one. I've got to live in a house with a woman who picks on me. I got a husband who doesn't understand me. And now I've got a pastor who accuses me. That's the next part of the story. Look at verse 9. And once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, here's what happened. Hannah, look what she did. She did what? She stood up. That's the game changer. Everything hinges right there on her standing up. You're like, what's she going to do? Now, Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And in her deep anguish, Hannah, look at this, she prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Have you ever done that? You ever prayed to the Lord just weeping bitterly? And she made a vow saying, Lord God Almighty, if you will only take on your servant's misery and remember, remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. And she kept praying to the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. By the way, this verse right here points out that you can actually pray and nothing can come out, but God can hear you. You may not have the energy. You may be in so much pain that you can't even get it out. The Bible even says that God can hear groans. 
And he'll interpret that on behalf of the Holy Spirit to give you words that you just can't even put together. God can hear your heart. And he hears Hannah's heart. But Eli, well, he didn't hear her heart. He thought she was drunk. And he said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk, woman? Put away your wine. He totally, just like a man, totally misses it. Here's what she says. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my anguish, out of my grief. Eli answered, realizing what was going on. He says, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you whatever you've asked of him. Now, not only does she have a rival who's trying to provoke her, or a husband who's lousy to console her, now she has a priest who misunderstands and accuses her. And Eli watches her, and, and, and she's praying fervently out of anguish, and he thinks she's drunk, and that she's been drinking too much wine. She says, no, Eli, Eli, I am pouring out my soul to the Lord. Her name means grace. But she's not feeling any grace from any direction. And that includes from above. It says in verse 5 and verse 6 that the Lord has closed up her womb. And Hannah isn't just sad, she's bitter. He knows this because here's what, here's what Elkanah says. He says, when she's weeping bitterly, he says, why are you downhearted? Remember that? Downhearted literally means, you can write this in your bulletin. I don't have it on my notes, but you can write it in your bulletin. Why is your heart so bad is what downhearted means. Why is your heart so bad? It's a phrase that they would use in the culture to refer to how, how bitter one's heart had become. Unfulfilled longings can do that over time, can't they? You ever been bitter? After unfulfilled longings, I mean, there's only so many comments from rivals one can take. There's only so many misunderstandings from loved ones that one can take. There's only so much discouragement from religious leaders that a heart can take before they go into a season of anguish and a season of bitterness. But what does Hannah do with her ang- anguish, anguish and her bitterness and her sadness? This is what I want you to pay attention to. Look what it says once again in verse 9. Once they had finished eating and drinking Shiloh, Hannah did what church? She did what? She stood up. She wasn't going to keep it bottled up anymore. She didn't run from God. I want you to hear this. She did not run from God in her bitterness. She ran to God. She didn't run from God in her resentment and her sadness. She ran to God. And she ran to God and God poured himself into her soul. Look what it says in verse 10. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. She went on. She says, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have been praying here in my great anguish, in my great grief. And after she explains to Eli what's going on, he says to her, go in peace. And may the God of Israel grant you whatever you ask of him. Look what it says. She said, may your servant... Find favor in your eyes. And then she went her way. And look at this. She ate something. And her face was what, church? Her face was what? No longer. It was no longer downcast. We'll return back to that in a moment. And as you read on, we see where the Lord remembers Hannah. It says in verse 20, it reads, So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant. And she gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. In verse 24, after he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. Verse 25, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman. Remember that woman? I am that woman that stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child I'm now holding. I pray for this child. And the Lord granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. There's so much here which I could go into, but I want to hit on a few things. Number one is this. Even when our longings go unfulfilled, God won't leave us unfilled. 
Even when our longings go unfulfilled, God won't leave you unfilled. Now notice that Eli says to Hannah, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you whatever you asked of him. And then notice what he says, what happens next. She goes on, she went her way and look at this, she ate something and her face was what? Her face was no longer downcast. That's the eureka moment. That's the moment where she notices and things change. And notice this, this is before she becomes pregnant. Even though a baby had yet to be conceived in her womb, something had been conceived in her soul. Her face was no longer downcast. And there's a peace that has been conceived in the soul of Hannah and it has nothing to do with a baby being born in her womb. This is important because at times we misread the story and they think, of course she's not, ga- down, not downcast anymore. She's pregnant. She got what she wanted. No, reread it. That's not the order in how things happen here. She had a peace in her soul before there was a baby in her womb. She had a peace before she had a child. What's that tell you? That tells you her peace is not tied to the kid. One doesn't have to be in a perpetual, downcast, bitter, or resentful state until their longings get fulfilled. Why? Here's why. Because God can be enough. Amen? Amen? God can be enough. He can fill what's empty inside of you. Even though you, your longings may be unfulfilled, her face is no longer downcast. It reminds me of a pastor who was going through a really tough season in his life, and he decided to do a 40-day fast from food. And after it was done, someone asked him if he had a breakthrough. And his response to that was, No. And the person just kind of apologized, said, I'm so sorry. He said, I'll tell you what I learned. I learned something much more important than a breakthrough. I learned this. I learned that God is enough. God is enough. You can have unfulfilled longings, but God won't leave you unfilled. Number two, when dealing with an unfulfilled longing, we must resist the temptation to push off from God instead of drawing near to God, even with our bitterness. Instead of pushing off from God, in her sadness, she draws near to God. And the turning point for Hannah is when she stood up. And when she stood up, she drew near towards God. And I just want to say from the core of my soul, there is somebody in this room right now that is bitter. And you're on the cross. You're you're right now. You have a crossroads. You can go left. You can go right. You can draw near God or you can push him away. And your bitterness. And right now, some of you are are so tempted to push him away. And I'm telling you, I'm imploring you, don't do it. Draw in. And it's not just about you, by the way. The decision you have before you will impact you for decades. But more than that, it'll impact people around you. And more than that, it'll impact generations to come. In your bitterness, I'm imploring, draw near, don't push away. It'll change your life. Intimacy with God is what comes to mind here too. There's a guy named Dennis Jernigan and he wrote many of our worship songs for several decades and he talks about intimacy as this. Intimacy means into me see. (laughs) Into me see God my anguish. Into me see my discouragement. Into me see God my plea. Into me see, God, my grief, my desperation, my frustration, my longing. Into me see. Because what happens as you pour yourself into God, he will pour himself into you. And Hannah's face is no longer downcast. Her peace preexisted before the kid. And because her peace was not tied to whether or not she got her longing. Hannah's peace came from God's presence when they were reunited and that reunification happened because she drew near to God rather than push away from God. And this isn't just true of people who have difficulty with having children or people who are having difficulty with their children. This is true of anybody with any agony of having any unfulfilled longing in their life. Our longings and our peace cannot be completely dependent upon a child or anything else in this world. Rather, our life and our peace comes from 
our creator. It comes from our heavenly father. It doesn't mean you don't hurt like Hannah. It doesn't mean there's times like Hannah that you don't have great concern or that you, it doesn't mean you don't have times of unhappiness. And I just want to say, there's nothing unspiritual with being unhappy. <laughs> you know, there's a difference though, I have to tell you, there's a difference between being unhappy and being, and being joyful. There's a difference between ja- joy and happy. Have you ever, how many of you guys have been to the beach recently in Florida? Raise your hand if you've been going to the beach. Some of you guys, spring break, all right? I tell you, if you go to the beach right now, if you just walk outside right now in Florida, I'm going to tell you right now, you have no reason to be unhappy. I'm just going to tell you how it is. Have you been to West Texas? Those people, they've got a reason to be unhappy. All right? West Texas is, goodness, when the, that place is designed to defeat the human spirit, if you don't know that. I mean, when the, when the curse was pronounced on the earth, that was the epicenter, West Texas. All right? Joy and happiness, though, are two different things. Happiness is of the moment. Happiness is temporary. If I told you, you just won a million dollars, I'd get a reaction out of you. But then if I said, everyone you know and you love, they just died in a horrible plane crash, that's happiness. It's there and then gone. I I can make you laugh, but that's not joy. Happiness is what's going on around you. Joy is despite what's going on around you. Happiness is being able to surf in a hurricane. It's great, it's happy until you're thrown over the top of a condominium and then it's not happy anymore. Joy is being able to sit in the eye of that storm, untouched by the waves, untouched by the wind. Joy is not the moment, it's a peace that passes all understanding and it comes from the inside out. It's a joy that comes from knowing whatever it is that reminds me that I and all of creation are in the hands of an immensely good and supremely competent God. No matter what is happening, I will always choose to draw near to God, that's the joy of the Lord. There's no other foundation. Nobody's found it. He did what I couldn't do. Through his son, he bought me back. He paid the ultimate price for me through his son. And the fires of hell can't touch me because the joy in God is bigger than any enemy I will ever face. Amen, church? And you can choose to say the same thing too. And once you experience, once you experience this joy and this love, you want to pass it on to other people. It's like eating something good. I mean, talk to Paul, talk to Job, and they'll tell you from the Bible, there's never been a storm that didn't stop. There's never been a hurricane that didn't, that didn't dissipate. There's never been a tornado that didn't stop twirling, an earthquake that didn't stop rumbling. They'll tell you to hang on to God. They'll tell you in the midst of your trial and your bitterness to draw near to God, to stay faithful to God. I mean, didn't Solomon teach us anything that everything is temporary? The good and the bad. Like a good roller coaster, life has its ups and downs. But if you base your life on the happiness of the moment, man, I'm going to tell you right now, you're in for a long and rough ride. Lock into the joy that passes all understanding. And it'll level everything out. Happiness means your disposition is related to certain happenings around you. There there are going to be times when certain things around you are not going to be very pleasing. Amen. I mean, I'm telling you right now, it's okay not to be happy from time to time and admitting that things are not going as I envisioned them to go right now in my life. But I want to tell you, there's a difference between what's happening to you and having your joy stolen. There's a difference between what's happening to you and having your peace stolen. You may not right now be involved in the 10 big sins. And I'll let you try to figure out what those 10 big sins are right now. You can make up that list however you want. But if Satan can't get you on the 10 big sins, he can steal something from you. He can rob something from you. He can rob you of your joy. You ever seen Christians, you know, you see them, you're like, I bet they don't do much sinning, but man, they're miserable. You mean, you look at it, look like they've been baptized in lemon juice or something. I mean, they look terrible. (laughs) Having your joy stolen is a miserable existence, but there's a tremendous joy in forgiveness. 
in Jesus Christ. But I want you to know that the victim, many are the victim of the destroyer as a counselor and a pastor and a friend. I've witnessed that people's joy has been stolen from them and they need it back. Because you're either someone who's going to, who's either someone like Hannah who's had your joy stolen or you're someone like Hannah who's also going to help somebody get their joy back. There are going to be times when you hurt. There's going to be times when you're let down and you have great concern. There's going to be times when you're going to be unhappy, but it doesn't mean you have to be trapped in a perpetual downcast state of unfulfilled longings. Whether you realize it or not, here it is. God is the strongest and greatest longing of all. That realization can only bear fruit as you draw near to God. And when you draw near to God, he will pour himself into you. And this was even true with Jesus, the son of God. Don't you, don't you know, as we look at Holy Week coming up and the last final week of Jesus' life and, and head into that as we head up to Easter next week, don't you know that, that he had a longing to not go to the cross? I mean, there he is. Before he gets arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's there, and he's, he's praying to God, checking in to make sure, is there not another way? Listen, there was nobody else more interested in there being another way besides God than Jesus. And he's praying, and there's such anguish inside his soul that he's sweating drops of blood. I've had anguish, but not to that level. Anguish where he's sweating drops of blood. Does he get his longing fulfilled? And the answer from heaven is no. He still has to go to the cross. But once you see what God does, look at verse 22. I mean, verse 43, Luke 22, it says, An angel appeared from heaven, and guess what happened? And did what to Jesus? And strengthened him. An angel came in that season and strengthen him in his life. And I don't believe God promises us that he'll give us, give us everything we asked of him, asked for him. God's not going to do that. But I do believe he will give us the peace we need to embrace his will. Amen. He will do that. How? By strengthening us to, to have peace so we can embrace his will when we draw near to him instead of push away from God. A lot of time, it's not just peace, though. It's also perspective. There's a name, Kathy Tricoli. She was a, a Christian musician, and she was very popular for a long time and in the top 40 of adult uh, Christian music. And it was interesting, in her mid-40s, she talks about when reality hit her that she would never have children. She realized and there was just a deep, deep sadness and she went into despair and she struggled with it. But in that season, she chose not to push away, but she chose to draw near to God. And because of that choice, God gave her a song. And the song was called A Baby's Prayer. And the baby's prayer, if you look these these lyrics up and encourage you to do that right on your notes, you know, Baby's Prayer, Kathy Tricoli. If you look up those lyrics, I'm telling you, they will mess you up. It's written from the perspective of a baby in a mother's womb of a mother that's about to abort the baby. And it'll blow your mind that the the love that God has for this child, but also the love that God has for this mom that's getting ready to make that decision. Of all things, after the song was released, Kathy received letter upon letter for year and years and about all the people who decided to keep babies, keep their babies, even though they had unplanned pregnancies, they decided to keep their babies instead of aborting their babies after they listened to her song. And one day, late at night, Kathy realized, you know what? Through this song, I've been able to see that there are more children alive than I could have ever had myself. <laughs> she saved lives because she chose not to push away in her bitterness, but draw near to God in her bitterness. That type of understanding only happens when we draw near to God. And a final point I want to make when it comes to Hannah is more of a question, and here it is. Will we dedicate what God has graced us with to his service? Will we dedicate what God has graced us with to his service? And I use that name grace intentionally because that's the meaning of Hannah's name. She finally gets pregnant. She has a son. She nurses him. And she does exactly what she said she would do. She takes her son to the temple. 
Look what it says in verse 27. I pray, she says, I pray for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I'll give him over to the Lord for his whole life will be serving the Lord. You're like, wow. She probably dropped him off when he was like preschool age. And some of you preschool parents, you're thinking on some bad days, you're like, that's not like a good idea. I want to go to the church and say, you raise them. <laughs> but that's what she does. It's like, why would she do that? You know, when you have something or you have someone in your life that you realize the only reason you have it is because of the grace of God, it's a lot easier to release back to God. Amen. When you realize that whoever that is or whatever that thing is, the only reason you have it is because of grace. It's a lot easier to release back to God. Just over 18 years ago, I'll never forget going to the doctor and hearing with my wife and hearing that we were going to have a girl. And you'll never... You probably can't appreciate this, but us Freemans, we don't make girls. Like, that doesn't happen. Like, that's impossible. And yet, God, God gave us a girl. And I never forget the moment we realized we were pregnant. In that moment, I realized this is grace. She's not mine, she belongs to the King of Kings, she belongs to the Lord of Lords. She's a gift from heaven. And so when you realize you've been blessed by heaven, and in moments like this, when she turns 18 and you celebrate it, another season of her life, you realize, you know what, once again in this season, I release her back to God. She's not mine. I have her on loan. I'm shepherding her heart for the Lord. She belongs to God. My sons belong to the Lord, and so I can release them to God because His grace. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve this church. This is grace. And so it's so easy to release this church back to God because it's grace. She drops her son off at the temple. And dedicates him for the service of God. And Samuel grows up to serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords for decades. And he changes a country. And he changes us. And all that service was fruit because a woman dedicated the grace that God had given her back to him. So let me ask you in the midst of everything you're seeking God for right now, because I know you're seeking things from God. Here's the question. Is everything you have already dedicated to the service of God? Is everything you already have, all of it, dedicated to the service of God? I love it when someone says, man, we got this house. We can't believe we've got this house, but guess what we're going to do with it? We're going to have a life group in it. Why? Because it's not our house. It's the Lord's house. And we make it available for the kingdom of God. It's grace. We release it to the Lord. I know all of us right now are seeking God for something. All of us are. So is what you have already dedicated to the service of God. So as we close, I want to talk to three groups of people. One group is those of you in the room right now and those online who feel like Hannah and you're so downhearted right now. I mean, you can't even lift up your head because of the burden that's on top of you. And, and it's just continued to come upon you and now you're struggling with bitterness and sadness and anguish and so what I'm going to ask you and challenge you to do right now is this just listen listen to the Lord He's here He's with you He has something to say to you and so right now I want to challenge you is we're going to sing a song I don't want you to sing I just want you to listen to God listen to Him speak to your heart listen, allow Him to hear your heart Hear your anguish, hear your plea, hear your frustration, and just be present with the Lord. It's amazing. We feel to spend time with God just for a few minutes and just listen. Not say anything, not have an agenda. Just go, God, what do you want to tell me? It's amazing how that downcast state gets lifted. So I want to challenge you if you're in group one, just listen. Be present. Just sit 
and don't do anything else. Just allow God to minister to your soul. If you're in group two, some of us, man, we realize that we've been blessed with incredible uh, uh, blessings from heaven and God has been too good to us and we realize it's grace. So my question to you is this, if you're in group two, today, what do you need to dedicate to the Lord? Is it your child? Is it your grandchild? Is it your health? Is it your job? Is it, you know what, God, all my resources are yours. I'm going to tie to the Lord. Is it your house? Is it your whole family? Is it your marriage? What is it right now that you need to dedicate to the Lord? I want to encourage you to write that on the card, the prayer card, the response card, and take it to the cross as, you, as we sing this song. You online can hit request prayer, and you can fill out what you want to dedicate to the Lord, and we would be honored to pray for whatever that is and just rejoice in that. Some of us have not dedicated some things to the Lord. What have you not dedicated? Do that right now. Here's a third group I want to talk to, and that's, you need to realize, Hannah gave up her son, but there was one who gave up his one and only son, not to God, but for you. God gave his son for you. And you need that salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ. Right now, you need to dedicate your life to God. And you need to say, you know what? My biggest longing of all is not my job, not relationship. My biggest longing of all is salvation. And I need to be made right. I need to make that right. Here's how you do it. You say to God right now, through Jesus Christ, I'm receiving Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. And now I'm going to dedicate my life to walk in Him. As, as Hannah dedicated Samuel, I'm dedicating my life to your son, God. And I receive Him as my Lord and Savior so I can be wiped clean of all my sins and now walk in holiness and purpose and life and in love. And on top of that, you write down a card, take it to the cross, but on top of that, go ahead and text baptism at RCC to 31996 because you need to walk in obedience with Jesus and be baptized. We got baptism day coming in a couple of weeks. And I'm telling you what, every week somebody comes up to me and says, my life has changed since the last baptism. Baptism Sunday, and that can be your story. So jump into it, stand up, make that move right now. Bapti baptism at RCC to 31996. And if that's too complicated for you, just go to our website, just go riverchristian.church slash baptism. Just go to our website and just slash baptism, and you can fill out that form. And I'm telling you right now, go ahead and start praying for uh, uh, April 8th and April 11th, because God's on the move. It's going to be phenomenal, all right? So you need, to, maybe you're in group through three, you need to make that move right now. And you need to stand up and say, I'm dedicating my life to Jesus Christ. So let's all stand up right now. Everyone, please stand. And I'm going to pray over all of you, whatever group you're in. And I'm going to pray that you make that move today. <sighs> Father God, we come before you. And Lord, my heart right now, along with your heart, is for those in this room and those online right now that have such a weight on them. That, Lord, they wonder if you can hear them anymore. And my prayer is that they will stop and they will just listen to you. And be still and know that you are God. And you hear them and you love them beyond anything they could ever comprehend. And so, Lord, may you speak into their soul right now to those people who are struggling with bitterness, who are downhearted right now. Lord, pray for those of us right now in a season of thanksgiving because we've seen you provide. We've seen you deliver. And Lord, right now, we need to dedicate something to you. We need to dedicate maybe a relationship, maybe a child, maybe a parent. Dedicate a spouse. Maybe dedicate our health, maybe a job, a house, whatever it is right now, God. Our resources. Lord, we need to write that down and we need to dedicate Whatever that is to you, understanding that everything we have is grace. Lord, thank you so much for your graciousness and your goodness to us. For every, every second, Lord, you are a good, good God. And Lord, right now, some of us need to take that step and need to dedicate our life to you for the very first time, saying Jesus is the Son of God. And we need to stand up and make that profession and give over our lives to you and, and, and head into the waters of baptism, telling the whole world, that we don't belong to the world anymore. We belong to Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. Wherever 
we're at right now, Lord, reveal to us and help us to stand with Hannah and draw near. Not push away, but draw near to you in this season of our lives. We pray this all in the name of your son, Jesus. The whole church said, amen. So whatever it is, why don't you stand up, make that move right now as we worship the King of Kings about the victory through Jesus. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper When the darkness falls, it won't prevail Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail Oh, my God will never fail and I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Turn it for good. You turn it for good. Come on, church, just declare that this morning. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. 
for this church, and we're going to have some fun today. We got 10,000 Easter eggs on our campus, and I need your help. Here's how I need your help. Make sure you bring people here so I don't have to pick them all up, all right? So uh, here's what we need help with. Make sure to invite people. It's not too late here, 3 to 5 o'clock. If you can help today, we need people meeting us on the field. If you go outside on the right side, which is uh, the north side of the property, we're going to meet there at 1145 right after the service, and we're going we're gonna to set up and get ready for the Easter egg hunt. So if you can help us, just head on out there afterward and we'll knock it out. If you can help us afterward, stay afterward and that would be a tremendous blessing if you can help us afterward as well. Also, don't forget, we have a Thursday night service. This Thursday night, we are going to continue our It Is Written. So if you want to stay involved in that service, all you have to do is show up here on Thursday night at 7 o'clock because we're not going to do it on Sunday morning next week because of Easter. And we're actually going to have it online for you online people so you can tune in at 7 o'clock on Thursday night online as well to join us. Hey, I'm excited about Easter. Are you excited about Easter celebrating the risen Jesus Christ? It's going to be awesome. So we got a 6.30 service happening right here behind our property uh, at 6.30. And uh, we got the Lord's Donuts. Krispy Kreme Donuts are going to be there and hope you can be there. Uh, you may have somebody who's kind of worried about COVID. That's a great service to go to. It's going to be outside. And then we have 9 o'clock right here and our third service. Really that day is going to be a 10.30 service. And we hope you invite people. So here's my question. Who's your one? Who's your one? Who are you going to bring for Easter this year? And I hope God reveals them to you and that, um, and that you move forward in that response of faith to invite them. Hey, I want to give a blessing to you before we close out. Here it is. When bitterness arises within us, may God calm your minds and may he soothe your hearts with his gentle words. And may he fill your whole soul and whole life with his perfect peace. And may your lives be shaped with God's peace rather than frustration. And with the Holy Spirit in your life, know this, you can overcome bitterness. And may you reflect God's character, and here it is, being slow to anger and rich in His steadfast love. Can we give God the praise for His blessing over us right now in our lives? I need that. RCC, we love you. God is with you. He goes before you. Go be a blessing. We'll see you later today, next week.